welcome back. We are back with another awesome Home with Olympus live session. We are bringing these to you live on Thursday nights and we're bringing in some new um, speakers as often as we can to help provide you with a really great education on your Olympus camera. So we're really thankful that you decided to join us tonight. Um, tonight we have a really awesome guest. We have Olympus educator Rob Knight joining us tonight. He is going to be talking to us a little bit about getting outside of our houses and exploring bird photography in our backyard and beyond. So Rob, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little about you? Sure. How's it going? Uh, yeah, my name is Rob Knight and um, I one of the main reasons I use Olympus cameras is for bird and wildlife photography. And so I, I'm really excited to do this program and talk about not only settings and, and the cameras and equipment that I use, but also some just general tips for bird photography. That's awesome. Well, we're super duper happy to have you tonight. And I know that I will probably learn a lot from this because I'm always aspiring to do better bird photography. So I hope I, I get something really good out of this. <laughs> and thank you so much for being here with us tonight. And thank you everyone down there in the comments for being here with us tonight. Um, definitely reach out to us with your questions. We will have a little bit of time towards the end to do a little Q&A with Rob, and we'll also be answering the questions as quickly as we can in the comments. If we don't get to them right away, don't worry. We will get your comments answered in the coming hours or days. We will get you handled. So I'll let Rob go ahead and take this over and get out of his hair. Cool. Let's see his presentation here. So have a good afternoon. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah. yeah, if you have any questions, do definitely um, post them in the chat. I'm not going to be paying too much attention to that, um, but there'll be some times when we can stop and I can I can get to your questions. So be sure and uh, definitely send in the questions and don't be upset that if I don't answer them right away. But um, what we're going to talk about today is exactly that, is, is bird photography. And um, since I use Olympus cameras, it's going to be bird photography with the Olympus cameras, obviously. but um, I this presentation is called Backyards and Beyond. And honestly, until last year, I didn't do a lot of backyard bird photography. I was on a panel with a couple of friends of mine and we were talking about photographing close to home. And I was actually a little bit embarrassed because I realized that I don't really usually photograph close to home unless it's snapshots of my kids and things like that. But, you know, as everybody we we were all stuck at home last year last spring um, about this time all of a sudden everything starts to close all of a sudden all the events that i was planning to go to uh, were canceled so i went from having all of these trips planned and all of these events to go teach and go photograph to having really nothing on my schedule so here i am doing this this talk and uh and we were talking about photographing close to home and i thought geez you know if I don't photograph close to home, I'm not going to be photographing much of anything. So uh, with really at the the inspiration of my friend David Akubian, I built my own sort of backyard bird studio. It was actually in my front yard in my case because uh, that's where the light was and where most of the birds are. And I've had so much fun over the last year. I mean, I probably took 10,000 images just last summer alone. Just I would get up in the morning, make myself a cup of coffee, go sit in my little my little spot. And uh, I had eight or 10 different setups, different perches where the birds would land. And I learned all, all sorts of things about the birds in my neighborhood. I, I learned about the camera equipment that I was using, about my EM1X and, and different settings for uh, wildlife and that kind of thing. So that's that was really the genesis of this program. Um, I do want to want to talk about this before we get into bird photography. And this this slide here, if you caught, you know, do a screen capture and grab this slide here, because the thing is, if you don't know how to use your camera, if you don't understand the exposure triangle, if you don't know how to uh, how to handle different lighting conditions, right? How to uh, read a scene, read the light, and adjust your camera in order to get a good exposure in different situations, then it's going to be hard for you to get into any specific discipline of photography, whether it's birding or real estate photography or portraiture or anything. If you don't understand the basics, then to go off into some specific niche is going to be a real challenge for you. 
And especially when we're talking about wildlife, we're talking about birds, you know, they're backlit against the sky sometimes. They're under the canopy of trees sometimes and really not enough light sometimes to make a picture. Um, I go to Costa Rica usually two or three times a year when in real life when when we can travel. So uh, a lot of the time my subjects are under two or three levels of jungle canopy in the dark. So I need to know that okay, well, I'm going to have to raise my ISO because I need a faster shutter speed and my aperture only opens so far, right? It, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, then you need to learn more about photography in general before you start getting into bird photography because it's more often than not, wildlife is not in the best light. You have to really go and search for it. And you know, the more you learn about wildlife, the more you learn about photography in general, you can learn to put yourself in a better position to make those better pictures and put yourself in a spot to, to be more successful based on the light and, and that kind of thing. And uh, as I'm sitting here, I'm watching the birds outside of my office window. It's great. That's why I'm here. But anyway, so learn the basics uh, before you start getting into specific uh, genres of photography. And let's talk about what makes a great picture. To me, there's four things that every great photograph have. They have an interesting subject. In this case, an American bison in Yellowstone, uh, or uh, I'm sorry, Grand Teton National Park. Uh, inappropriate light. And I shy away from using the term good light because good light is completely subjective based on what you're shooting. What's good light for this bison here uh, would not necessarily make a good portrait lighting or good landscape lighting. You know, in this case, he's sort of backlit, sort of side lit. So it gives him that cool rim light around the top of his head. And, uh, and it highlights the steam coming out of his, uh, his nose, his breath in that cold morning. So it's whatever is appropriate for your subject. And you need a supporting background. Again, that's completely subjective to what your, what your subject is. In this case, it's this sort of out of focus, blown out sky behind him. And it really helps this dark animal stand out from his background. Um, and more often than not, you're going to want a moment or a gesture. And especially when we're photographing living creatures, whether it's people or whether it's wildlife, you know, birds, whatever, uh, that moment is really important. And, and I want to talk about that for a second because there's a lot of nature photography out there that I see on, you know, whatever, whether it's Facebook or Instagram and that kind of thing, that it, it does little more than prove that your equipment works. And, and I don't mean that to, to bash anybody or talk down to anybody's uh, about anybody's work. But I think as photographers now, what just 10 years ago, 15 years ago, just to capture an animal in, in the wild, in sharp focus with a long telephoto zoom lens, that was a feat in itself. When, when these guys, and this was before my time, even, you know, 20 years ago, when guys were, were making beautiful images like this on film with huge heavy lenses and, and, and a lot of people still use the big heavy gear. It was a lot more amazing just that the photograph exists. Right. Um, but now any camera you buy in the last five or 10 years, maybe is probably good enough to get at least as good a shot as you would have seen in national geographic 25 years ago. The, the equipment is there. The equipment is not tens of thousands of dollars, you know, for a few thousand dollars, you can have a really nice camera and a really long zoom lens. And so you can zoom in and get that picture of, of whatever animal. So at this point, I think more than any other time, it's important to push yourself to go beyond just getting the animal's eye in focus. And that's one of the tenets of, of wildlife photography. You want the eye in focus, right? But Great, get the eye in focus and then capture that moment, capture that gesture. Uh, you know, I could have, I, I took lots of pictures of this bison, but this one where he's breathing out and you can see the steam uh, condensing in the air around him and the, the backlit as he comes out from behind this tree and I get that nice rim light around him and he's looking directly into the camera lens. These are the things that make a really compelling image. And a bison just standing there by itself is not necessarily a great photo. It, you, you can absolutely be proud that your equipment works, that you got the focus point right on his eye, but is it a compelling photograph? And the answer a lot of times without that moment or that gesture is going to be no. So, you know, challenge yourself to push beyond just 
capturing, just displaying the, the animal and, and proving that you saw it. So what, what about a bird photo? We know what makes a great photograph. And lo and behold, it's all those four things that are the same, an interesting subject. And with birds, uh, I guess it's assumed if you're photographing birds, you think birds are interesting. So obviously there's so many shapes and sizes and colors and everything of, of birds that um, it's no wonder that so many people uh, photograph birds. And I mean, heck, there's a whole society of people who only look at birds. They don't even need to photograph. They just enjoy looking at them. So um, birds are definitely a great subject. The appropriate light, uh, again, depends on the subject, even if that subject is always a bird, right? Uh, in this case, this, this was kind of an overcast afternoon in Costa Rica, as a matter of fact, and that overcast light makes the whole world a big soft box. It makes this soft light so that I can capture the detail uh, in this egret's feathers without overexposing the highlights. Right on a sunny day, and a bird like this is really hard to capture because you have to expose for the highlights so that you don't blow out the highlights on the bird, and you, and there's still detail in all the white. But in this case, that overhead light was really great for this particular subject. Uh, the supporting background again, um, in this case, that soft overcast light made it really easy to get an exposure that captures the bird and the background in the same light and the same exposure without having to do any sort of heroic Photoshop to try to save a blown out background or to try to save a too dark background. Everything was in nice, even light and uh, the, the background's not too busy. It's You can tell that it's water, so you know it's a water bird and he's standing on a log in the river. Um, so this is what the kind of thing that you should look for. It's not just a, you know, it, it, we're not shooting in the studio here. You don't necessarily want just a blank background behind behind a bird. And the moment in this case is the way that the egret has his head turned. He has his neck kind of cocked. He's he's in the midst. Of, he's in the middle of of preening and and cleaning his feathers. And, and it's just this one moment where he looked up and paused. You know, that's the moment. That's the gesture in this case. And, and this is where uh, bird photography becomes a little bit different than some other types of photography. Is uh, generally you want to get close to your subject. And when we're using Olympus cameras or, or anything, you want to fill the frame with your subject as much as possible. And, you know, you can, we have a 20 megapixel sensor and that's, that's a, a lot of resolution there. Sure. There's, you know, higher res, uh, uh, image sensors out there, but I don't really want 50 megapixels every time I pull the trigger, especially when I'm photographing wildlife. So, for me, 20 megapixels is enough, but I definitely want to use every one of those pixels I can to draw the picture of the bird for me, okay? I don't want to take a picture of this egret that takes up 10% of my frame and then try to zoom in and wonder why I don't see any detail. So 10% of that 20 megapixel frame is two megapixels. So you wouldn't go shoot wildlife with a two megapixel camera, right? Because it's 2021. So you want to try to fill the frame with that bird or or whatever your subject is, especially with wildlife, because fur and feathers and that kind of thing have so much detail. You want to employ as many of those pixels as you can to, to capture those details. So often that means using a telephoto lens. Um, I use the, the 100 to 400 millimeter Olympus lens a lot. I use the 300 millimeter F4 Pro a lot. Um, I've probably used that lens, especially with the two times teleconverter, uh, the MC 20 for, I have probably used that more than anything on any of my Olympus cameras. Uh, the 150 to 400 millimeter F 4.5 pro is, uh, it's amazing. It's basically the, the dream lens. Um, but either way we're, we're using a longer lens because we want to try to fill the frame. We want to try to zoom in on the, that wildlife. And I think what you're going to find and what a, a lot of us, um, I remember the first time I got a 300 millimeter lens and I thought, here it is. I'm going to be able to just zoom in on those birds from so far away and uh, I fill the frame with them and make National Geographic pictures. And then you look through the camera at 300 millimeters and you realize immediately that, well, those National Geographic guys, they have a long lens and they and they're right next to the birds you still have to get close. So a lot of times that means putting yourself in a different position. It means uh, knowing where the birds are and going to where they are, excuse me, and having that long telephoto lens. I have some good news for you. If you're not a big bird nerd, 
is that you don't have to be a great birder to get great bird photographs. Take me, for example. I'm not a great birder. There, there are guys, uh, some of my colleagues, Kevin Lachlan, Lee Hoy. Uh, I know a lot of guys. Th these are the guys that I send them pictures and say, okay, what's this? Because I like photographing birds. I really enjoy it. They make beautiful subjects. Um, I know a lot of the birds for where I normally go in Costa Rica because I see them year after year. Um, but I am not, I don't know every species of everything and I can't call them out from memory. Um, birds are only one of the things I photograph. I photograph birds and wildlife and I like travel photography and I like architecture photography, all sorts of things. I just like making pictures. Um, but I don't feel like I'm at a disadvantage because I can't name every bird that I photograph right off the bat. However, the more you know about your subject, the better your chances of being successful are. And that doesn't just go for birds. That goes for anything. That goes for um, sports, especially. You know, wi shooting wildlife is a lot like shooting sports. In fact, when I take my clients to uh, Costa Rica to photograph wildlife, we usually go to the beach one day and photograph surfers. And I call it photographic cross-training. Because you're using a lot of the same techniques. You're using the same sort of autofocus techniques, the same kind of tracking that you would use for wildlife photography. But it's just a different subject and a different set of, you know, challenges for the light and, and that kind of thing. So um, in this particular example, um, these scarlet macaws, they were in, in Costa Rica and there was this one tree. It had these almonds on it and there must have been two dozen scarlet macaws and they would generally take turns flying to these little bunches and taking the almonds and eating them. And at first, I, the group of photographers I was with, we were just excited to see all of these macaws, these beautiful, huge birds. They're, uh, you know, so fun to photograph because they're so colorful. And, and it was kind of just, just a free for all. We're just shooting and shooting. And then after a few minutes of observation, we realized that, well, before the bird, the next bird that's going to fly to eat, starts doing this little motion with his head. And so then we started calling it out like, okay, the guy on the top right is going to fly now. And so then we could all focus on that particular bird and wait. And then when he took off, we were all ready. We had our settings right. We had our uh, autofocus. Uh, all, everything was all framed up and we're ready to shoot. So you don't have to know everything about birds. You just have to pay attention. And, and that goes for lots of things, but especially with bird photography, because a lot of times, you know, if you're traveling, you're going somewhere that you, uh, you know, some unfamiliar place, a place you've never been, um, you're not necessarily going to have all of the local knowledge and all the inside track about where to go for all the birds. But uh, if you ask questions of local birders, if you email people before you go, or if you simply pay attention and watch the patterns that that invariably happen with wildlife, then you can be more uh, knowledgeable about what you're trying to photograph and you'll be, you'll, chances are you'll have better results. So let's talk about a, a few different types of bird photographs because bird photography is not just, uh, it's not just this shot here, you know, this black hawk in Costa Rica. This is uh, a pretty typical photograph of a bird, right? It's, it, pretty much proves that I saw the bird. The eye is in sharp focus. The composition is fine. I like, I, I did intentionally frame the bird in a particular way so that, uh, the, the branches that he's on make a, a frame within my frame. Um, but, uh, you know, this is just an ID photo basically. And the way that I challenge my students when we're on location is, uh, especially say you go to Costa Rica and it's your first time in Costa Rica, you're going to see some amazing things. I still see something new every time I go. And I've been, I've been there two dozen times. I still literally have seen something I've never seen before every time I go. And, um, and that's, you know, it's usually wildlife, usually birds. So, you know, you want to get the shot. Okay. You see this amazing wildlife that you've never seen before and you definitely want to grab the shot. So do, go for it. Get that ID photograph, right? Um, throw your camera up, get the shot. And then if you have the opportunity, when you have the opportunity, then start looking at how that bird is interacting with this environment. Um, how can you make your composition better? Right. Um, there was, when I was in Costa Rica just last month, there was a, a trogon, a male a trogon, beautiful, big, colorful bird. And, uh, and he was sitting on this branch and I said, Oh man, I, I took a picture of him. And then he was, 
pretty darn comfortable. And so I got a chance to walk all the way around where he was standing, photograph him from different angles, wait for him to turn his head a few different ways. Um, I got to really work the subject. And you know, the first few pictures I got were, were just sort of, you know, eh, ho-hum pictures. But then since I had the opportunity, I took that opportunity to, to then really thoughtfully compose a good photograph of that bird that goes beyond just that ID. Uh, another type of bird photo that I really like is, is a, an intimate portrait. And this is not something that you get a chance to do every time you see a bird by any means, right? This, this uh, hummingbird, as a matter of fact, this is not cropped at all. And I shot this picture with a macro lens. So this is a photograph of a bird that's about this big and I'm standing probably this far away from it. And we were photographing, uh, some hummingbirds on, on these feeders. And this one guy just landed on the wire right next to me. And so I reached into my bag and I pulled out my camera with the macro lens on it. And I just got it closer and closer and closer. And I, I love the little look on his face. He's he had to turn his head cause he can't really see around his beak with both eyes and looking at me like, are you serious, man? And you know, this is, this is a view that you normally don't see. And that's, I think that's the key to these kind of intimate pictures is to, it's a close up because we don't normally see birds this close up, right? You don't normally see only the, you know, the bird's face just full frame like that. You don't get the chance to study these animals in this way because they're fast, right? They're small and they're fast and you don't normally, uh, yeah, I've got a print of this, 20 by 30 in my hallway. And it's just, it's mesmerizing to look at all the little detail and all their feathers. And um, so that's another way to sort of show birds in a different way that can be a really compelling photograph. Bird behavior is one of my favorite uh, ways to showcase birds in pictures. And it, it's one thing, again, um, this is a typical sort of a story in Costa Rica. These, these two cans, um, one of the places where I host workshops in Costa Rica, there's a, usually a pair of two cans that nest right off, right off of the balcony of the hotel. So we get a chance to see them pretty regularly. And, uh, and these, uh, this couple was particularly lovey dovey that day, right? They were, they were, uh, grooming each other and kind of, I, I, it looked like they were snuggling. I don't know how else to put it. And I'm, again, I'm not an ornithologist, but, uh, they were certainly not being mean to each other. They were being very friendly and very nice. And to me, this, this shows a little more about the bird, right? This is not just, Oh, two cans are pretty. This is, well, these two cans are obviously a pair and they care about each other and they are caring about each other in this particular way by grooming each other's feathers. Um, and to me, it's much more of a moment. It's it. This is the definition of that gesture, right? And I think pictures like this are so fascinating. It's something I definitely strive for when I'm out shooting. And um, in fact, when I'm in Costa Rica with with a group, I'm if I'm leading a workshop, I'm not there to shoot necessarily, right? Um, it's really about me making sure that my clients are photographing and that they're getting uh, their opportunities and making the most of those opportunities. So um, a lot of times, I don't even pick up a camera unless it's really something beautiful, really something compelling. The light's beautiful. The moment is, is just really something special. So this is the kind of thing that I will still shoot, um, and still, you know, really encourage my students. Like this is, this is what we're looking for. You know, it's cool that you have a picture to prove that you saw a toucan, but when you can photograph, uh, this family pair, uh, interacting with each other, that becomes really a fascinating photograph. A bird in their environment is also a great way to uh, add a little more description to wildlife, right? It's not just, here's a bird. It's, here's a bird. He's on the side of a river. Uh, he's on this dark tree limb. Um, you know, this is a great way to tell more of a story about wildlife is to include more of their background. And again, this is not something where you, you know, you use every inch of zoom that you have to fill the frame with a bird, but you're, you're specifically including the, uh, the background to tell the story. This is also another great example of why you have to know how to operate the camera before you go out and try to make these pictures. 
if you just have your Olympus camera set in P for program auto and point the camera at this scene, it will be massively overexposed. Okay. Because the thing that makes this picture really interesting is the white bird against the dark background. Okay. Most of the photo, most of the frame is that dark background. Well, the camera's meter doesn't want anything to be dark. It wants everything to be medium. All right. So it will expose everything to be medium. So in this case, in order for the dark background to be medium uh, luminance, it's going to overexpose it. So by overexposing the background, the bird would be just a white spot with no detail at all and completely overexposed. So I have to know as the photographer, if I'm going to photograph a white egret in a beam of sunlight against the dark background, I have to, according to the camera's meter, I have to underexpose so that I'm exposing for the highlights on the egret and I let the, the background just fall to that uh, dark exposure and that's perfectly fine because the point is the white bird, the detail and the feathers, that beauty against the dark background. So again, you have to know how to use your camera before you go making pictures, whether they're pictures of birds or anything else. Another good example of how you need to know how to use your camera is photographing birds in flight. And this is a, uh, a big challenge for people. It's a big draw for people. It's a big, um, uh, a lot of questions that I get about bird photography are, for example, what settings I use for birds in flight. Now, to answer that question, you really need at least a 1250th of a second to freeze a bird in flight. And it depends on the bird. Some birds are faster. You might need more speed than that. But if you're shooting under a 1250th of a second, chances are that bird's going to be blurry in flight. Um, that makes it uh, a real challenge to photograph birds in flight on anything but a bright day. Um, if you're on an overcast day or it's early in the morning, you're going to be hard pressed to get pictures of a bird in flight that's with enough shutter speed to get the bird frozen and crisp and everything else. Um, Again, you have to know how to operate the camera. You have to know about exposure and how to adjust that to, to, uh, to use this sort of thing, to photograph birds in flight. Um, the EM1X also has uh, bird detection autofocus, which in my experience with it, with almost every bird I've pointed it at in, in the sky, it picks it right up. Um, so that works pretty well. I use continuous autofocus a lot of times, not the continuous with tracking. Um, Although I'm using that more in the EM1X, uh, but it is a new feature and I'm just used to working the other way with continuous autofocus. And um, you always wanna use enough focus points so that the camera can predict where the bird is going to move within the frame. In other words, if you only use a single focus point, even if you're in continuous autofocus, you're not giving the camera an opportunity to track anywhere around the, uh, the viewfinder. So if, if you use a group of five or nine uh, focus points, then the camera can track that bird within that section. So as long as you keep him inside of the square where you've decided, you know, your focus is going to be, then the camera does a great job of tracking. This is also a great uh, example of why you need to observe your subject and uh, learn about their, their patterns so that you can be successful. Because um, this was that same tree of scarlet macaws in Costa Rica. And every now and then two of them would fly off and, uh, scarlet macaws mate for life. And if you see one, you almost always see two because they're, they're mated pairs and they kind of go everywhere together. So we would see the two birds would fly over our heads. And by the time we realized that they would be pretty much right in front of us and they would do this big loop and then fly back to the tree. So we knew after just a few minutes that if the two birds flew over our heads, then we were going to be able to get this shot of them as they flew in this gap between the trees on our right. So they would take off and you could immediately just set up your shot and get ready and fire away. And, and then we got to take, got lots of opportunities to get a shot like this with, I like their backs to me so I can see the yellow and the blue and the red and uh, their wings spread and, and the whole thing. So um, by observing the, you have a better chance of, of getting great shots. And that's why people a lot of times go places that specifically have um, setups where you can sit and they know the birds are going to fly in this particular direction. The light's going to be at your back. The bird, that's, that's how uh, most of the time, that's how people get great 
uh, birds and flight shots is by really doing a lot of preparation in advance. Now, I love the, the art of birds as well as just the specific photograph of a bird. Like I said, I photograph birds among lots of other things. So for me, um, when I can use birds as just one element in a, in a photograph, I think that's really fun. Like, like a flock of birds. This was in uh, Pocosin Lakes uh, National Wildlife Refuge in North Carolina. And these just thousands of red winged blackbirds were so cool. And when they moved, it was like, like this one, like a, like a cloud with a mind of its own. And I just thought that was so, so cool. Or if you go somewhere like Bosque del Apache in New Mexico and, you know, tens of thousands of snow geese take off from a lake at, at once in the sunrise, it, it can be just breathtaking and make really fantastic photos. And that's, that sort of leads into, you know, using birds as art, just one more design element, right? Um, this is a, a, a good commercial for always having your camera in your hand and having it ready. Uh, I was, we were in Costa Rica and my clients were getting their gear out of the van in order to photograph the sunrise or the sunset over the Pacific. And, and we were kind of sitting around and uh, every, every evening you'll see these squadrons of pelicans fly in these, these straight lines across, and they'll go. Um, I'm not, I guess they go from where they've been eating during the day to where they nest at night. And this one line was going directly overhead and it was so beautiful with the sunset light hitting them from the side and the, the puffy clouds behind them. And I just happened to have my camera in my hand and literally just fired a shot straight up and got this, this picture. But I think it's so cool because it's not, it's not a picture of pelicans necessarily. I mean, even though that's the, what the subject is, it's really just the, the design, right? It's the, this, this line of animals and the beautiful light and the puffy clouds. And it's about contrast and line. And, um, I, I like that as much as cool. I got the eye sharp and I, I got the, the bird that I wanted to capture. So when we're talking about, um, cameras for bird photography, I'm going to skip over, um, point and shoot cameras. There's point and shoot cameras that have really long focal lengths and, and, uh, and that's great. And if you're, if you're just, a birder and you're looking to get into simply recording what you see, then something like that can be fine. But if you're really looking to make beautiful photographs of birds, you really need something with a larger sensor and, um, you know, micro four thirds and a 20 megapixel chip. I I'm here to tell you, <laughs> they make great pictures of birds. Uh, you want interchangeable lenses because then you can make that tool into whatever you want. You know, if you're going out to photograph birds, you get a telephoto lens. And if you're, if you want to photograph macro subjects, you can change the lens and now it's a, now it's a macro camera, right? So interchangeable lenses are a must reliable autofocus when it comes to bird photography is, is a no brainer. Of course you want reliable autofocus, good autofocus tracking. Now, whether that's something that literally says tracking, like the Olympus bodies have, have uh, CAF plus tracking in my experience, the regular CAF works better. It tracks better than the tracking. Now that might not be true with the, with the bird detection. I'm talking about just regular tracking. Um, but uh, on the EM1 Mark III, the EM1 Mark II, the EM1X, there the continuous autofocus works really well at, do, at predicting the, uh, the path of moving subjects. Now, image stabilization is something that I am absolutely spoiled rotten with. I've been using uh, Olympus cameras for 11 years now or 11 or 12 years now. And I was instantly, uh, instantly spoiled by the fact that I can handhold a shot at a 30th of a second all day long without even trying to hold still. Uh, image stabilization is fantastic in general. But when we're talking about longer focal lengths and we're talking about bird photography, it's really, uh, you, there's, well, I was going to say there's no substitute for it, but there is. The substitute is is this right here. The substitute is always carrying your tripod everywhere you go and setting up your tripod for every shot that you make. That's the substitute. Um, from experience, uh, that is not as uh, as it's not as flexible a way to work. I was thinking about this in Costa Rica last month. There was uh, a uh, an orange-colored mannequin. It's this little tiny 
uh, beautiful bird and we were trying to find it and we found it and he was all over the place and he's flitting around and I was trying to get a shot. And if I had had to sit there and set up a tripod and just wait for him to end up in front of me, I never would have gotten the shot. Instead, I've got, I was using the EM1X and the 150 to 400 millimeter F4 lens. So I'm shooting with the teleconverter, I'm shooting at a thousand millimeter effective focal length. And I know I can handhold that camera and that lens at 120th of a second. 200th of a second, no problem, because the image stabilization allows me to do that. And so I can go over here and get down on one knee, try to find the bird. I can stand up over here. I'm not tied to one spot and I don't have to deploy this machine on the ground so that I can make a picture. And that is invaluable. And I, I will, <laughs> I will never try to shoot wildlife photography without that level of image stabilization on the with the em1x and, or the the mark three and the new telephoto lenses the with uh, the sync is you're getting it's like six and a half or seven and a half stops of stabilization that's amazing and it and it is it's like magic now i've got a question mark by high frame rate because it really cracks me up when when i read a camera review and they say well it's not good for sports because it only shoots six frames per second and i laugh and wonder what the newspaper photographer in the 1970s who you know who took the pictures of you know the the game winning home run like what would he say if he had six frames per second he'd be like oh my god this is the, it's like a miracle right but for us in 2021 if a camera doesn't shoot 20 frames per second then it's it you can't use it for wildlife and i think that's hilarious um i almost always shoot in continuous low if i'm using the continuous frames um because 10 frames per second is plenty for me, uh, for what I shoot, for how I shoot. Plus with the Olympus cameras, you can still use continuous autofocus and continuous low and continuous high. The focus is locked on the first frame. So the camera is not going to track your subject. Um, for me, if I get 18 frames per second, but only the first three are in focus, that doesn't help me. Right. Um, so, you know, our Olympus cameras have a high frame rate, but I usually use a little bit lower anyway. Here's the most important thing um, when it comes to uh, using tools, right? And especially for wildlife photography, I'm going to get this thing out. Um, I use the, the EM1X because of because it fits my hand like a glove, because I, I just love to hang on to it. Sometimes if I have this camera over my shoulder, I literally hold the grip just because it feels good right? It's so comfortable. The vertical grip is just as comfortable. I shoot a lot of vertical frames. Um, birds are sort of vertically shaped creatures. So uh, I shoot a lot of vertical shots. Um, but bird photography is kind of like fishing, right? You're going to set up, you're going to set up for the best case scenario. You're going to make educated guesses about what equipment to use and where to go and what time to be there. And then you hope that the animals cooperate. All right. So bird photography is a lot of waiting sometimes. So if you've got a piece of machinery in your hand that's not comfortable to hold and you sit there for three hours, it's going to be a bad day. If you've got something that just feels good in your hand, and it's comfortable and it's great and you don't mind holding it, it, it makes your day a whole lot better. So um, this is a great uh, commercial for anybody's local camera store. At this point, I live in Atlanta and we don't even have a camera store. Uh, our, our, you know, sort of standard run-of-the-mill camera store closed our last one closed a couple of years ago so i don't have a place where i can go and try all the new things and hold every camera in my hand and see what it feels like so if you do have that opportunity god bless you take advantage of it you know support your local camera store when it comes to lenses i two or three hundred millimeters is absolutely minimum and 400 plus is better the um the, the beauty of the micro four thirds system is that two times crop. When we're talking about bird photography, I put my 300 millimeter lens on here and it's a, it's the same field of view as a 600 millimeter lens. That's huge. If I put the two times teleconverter on it, guess what? It's a 1200 millimeter lens. I love that. Uh, we've got lenses like the 100 to 400 F5 to 6.3. That's a 200 to 800 millimeter lens on my EM1X, and I can use teleconverters on it and make it a 1600 millimeter lens. The, the more, the better. You know, if, if you think you want to photograph birds, look into something like, even something like the 70 to 300, which is a sort of lower price, not exactly a pro lens, but 
the the 100 to 400 is a fantastic option for um not spending all the money in the world and still getting a nice versatile lens for birding um, all the uh the long tail photo lenses for olympus are image stabilized and those stabilizers work in conjunction with the stabilizer in the body which is great um <laughs> again if you know about photography then you know that a wide maximum aperture is a benefit uh, when it comes to bird photography in particular, because we want to have as much shutter speed as we can get. Okay. You want to, uh, you want to freeze that action, right? Because we're photographing a moving subject. We're photographing birds. Is, we want to, uh, as much shutter speed as we can. We don't want to have to raise the ISO up to 12,000 in order to do that. So whenever we can use the fast max, the uh, wide maximum aperture lens, that's what we're going to do. Something like the 40 to 150 is an f2.8. The 300 millimeters an f4. Um, it lets in a lot of light and you can get a lot, little more shutter speed out of it. Now, talking about prime versus zoom lenses, this conversation was different several years ago when it was a given that if you wanted the sharpest lens, you get a prime lens. Uh, prime lens is simply one that's a fixed focal length like the 300 millimeter f4. It's not a 300 to something else. It's only a 300 millimeter lens. It's a fixed field of view. Uh, versus uh, 100 to 400, for example. So I'll tell you a little story. Uh, the picture on the left is called a Huatzin. And I've made this picture in Peru along the Amazon River. This was the first day of a uh, photography workshop that I was co-leading for Wildside Nature Tours. And we, our guide, this was the first trip out on the boats. When we first got there, first got to our, our houseboat and we went out to photograph wildlife. And these birds are enormous. They're it's like turkey sized, crazy looking. It's one of those things that you see like every day along the Amazon. They're like, oh my God, I've never seen anything like that. Well, this is the only picture I got of this bird because I've got my EM1X with the 300 millimeter F4 and the two times teleconverter on it. My zoom lenses and everything else was in my bag, which was at the other end of the boat, which I couldn't possibly get to because all the clients were, were between me and that. I couldn't have gotten to them. So I see this bird and the guy pulls the boat up right up next to him. And then he starts, cut, he jumps branch to branch. And before I know it, he's right over my head. And this is as far back as I could get. This is the only thing I could do. So this is the best picture I have of this bird. Now it's sharp. It's wicked sharp. It's great. So on the right here, this toucan basically did the same thing while we were photographing. He, he decides to jump closer and see what we're doing. I had a zoom lens, so I was able to back out and get the entire bird. Otherwise I would have had the same picture. I would have had a nice tight portrait of a toucan. So for me, uh, the modern technology that they use to design lenses, um, especially the Olympus Mzuiko lenses are super sharp. The, the pro lenses are as sharp as any lens I've used on any system really. And um, so you're not really giving anything up by using a zoom lens. Uh, in most of the time. And in fact, you're gaining because you have that flexibility. And I know most people don't have the money to buy every lens that comes out. So if you want something versatile, you know, a nice zoom lens, the 100 to 400, or if you're, you know, if you're really serious, the 150 to 400 at four or five, um, these are, these are fantastic lenses. This is, this is kind of my loadout. If I'm shooting for bear or if I'm loaded for bear and uh, kind of ready for anything, for birding specifically, the 100 to 400, uh, the 300 millimeter F4 Pro, a lot of times I'll use the 40 to 150.28 and then the 300 millimeter with the teleconverter. So I have kind of the flexibility of the two Pro lenses uh, with something wider and then something with a little more reach to it. And I use the EM1X and the EM1 Mark III cameras uh, pretty much all the time. Uh, I do, I, although I love the EM5 Mark III. Uh, it's basically an EM1 Mark II in a smaller body. And I think that's fantastic. And um, the the first Olympus camera that I really fell in love with was the original EM5. And so it's kind of, a, it's a little nostalgic for me. I, I dig it. But if I'm carrying anything else with me, I, I carry a tripod less and less because A, I don't have to. Uh, and B, unless I'm really going to photograph uh you know, the Milky Way or something like that, where, I, or if I'm doing sunsets and sunrise and, um, I, I might do long exposures. I usually leave the tripod at home for a lot of stuff, especially for birding. But, um, I love this, 
uh, photo pro tripod with a little gimbal on it. It's the beauty of our, our little system, right? We can use these long telephoto lenses and just have this little lightweight tripod. Um, you want to be sure when you're picking out a tripod, get something that's tall enough for you to use, right? I'm six feet, three inches tall. I have to have a tall tripod because the tripod that holds the camera at my sternum level doesn't do me any good. I'm not going to use it. It's, it, it's, if it's not comfortable for you to use, you're definitely not going to use it. If it's too heavy for you to carry, you're not going to use it. So, you know, get something. If you're going to buy a tripod, get something that's that you can actually use. Um, another thing that I use some of the time is a is a flash uh, with an extender. Now, if you're using telephoto lenses, you're going to need a flash extender. Okay, uh, the flash is not not going to throw light far enough to to match your 600 millimeter lens. But you can use something. I use the Magmod. Uh, mag beam extender and uh, that works beautifully for giving a little pop of light a little fill light sometimes like i said up you know in the jungle canopy um it works great for that so let's talk about settings uh we're gonna uh, i'm trying not to keep you here too too long tonight but um there's really three ways that i know uh most professional photographers that i know photograph wildlife uh, birds included. And uh, so I'm going to talk about those and I'll end with the one that I use. So manual exposure mode is maybe the most obvious way to go, right? You control the aperture, the shutter speed, and the ISO. Great. Full control. No surprises. The camera's not going to change anything and that you didn't notice. Uh, your exposure is consistent. Um, for birds in flight, this is fantastic because you can set your exposure. And if the bird passes from somewhere with a dark background to somewhere in front of the bright sky, no problem, right? Your exposure is not going to change. The light doesn't change in that case. The only thing that changes is the background. And that can throw off the camera if you're using a semi-automatic uh, shooting mode. On the other hand, the reason I, I only use uh, manual exposure mode for particular instances is because uh, for example, if I'm on a riverboat in Costa Rica and half of the, uh, this half of the river is in bright sunlight and this half is in the shade, the exposure, it might be three or four stops different between this side of the river and that side of the river. And it's very likely and happens all the time that, oh, well, there's a monkey over there. Let me photograph that. He's in the bright sunlight. I, my exposure is, you know, a thousandth of a second. And then, oh, there's a, bird a beautiful bird that we never see here oh my gosh it's right there grab a picture and he's in the shade well i'm at a thousandth of a second and i swing my camera over and i'm five stops underexposed because now i'm in the shade and not in the sun so now i've got to i've got to adjust my shutter speed and and people that shoot like that i i know great photographers that shoot in manual mode all the time and they think probably think i'm a big sissy for not doing that but i can tell you for my clients um i i had a, one client in particular tell me uh on, on the riverboat in Costa Rica. I said, How, how's it going? And she was a good photographer and experienced. And I said, are you getting any good shots? And she said, no, not really. I, you know, by the time I go from one side to the other, I'm missing shots because I'm trying to expo uh, adjust my exposure. And, and I know photographers always all shoot manual mode. So that's what I'm doing. And I said, you know what? Photographers use whatever mode they need to make the shot that they want to make. So I, I suggested that she shoot like I shoot. I'm going to talk about that in aperture priority. And she said, okay, I'll try it. And 15 minutes later, she was, she had a big smile on her face because now she's getting shots because now the camera is helping her to photograph in the shade and in the sun and, and to make those changes so fast uh, that she wasn't missing shots. So it really depends on what you're shooting. Um, so that's why I don't shoot in manual exposure mode all the time. I certainly do when I need to though. Uh, another way that's been really popular for this past several years is to, uh, use manual exposure mode, but with auto ISO, right? So you set the aperture and the shutter speed, and then the camera picks the ISO for you. And um, so you can, if you're photographing birds that are moving, you're using a long lens, you need to keep that shutter speed fast, right? So you want to keep it 1500th of a second and you keep your, uh, your aperture wide open to let in lots of light. And then the camera can move, can float the ISO for you. Um, so that's fine. Uh, and that works, that works great, but it, it's a semi-automatic mode. And, um, what I found is that in low light in, in Costa Rica, for example, under the jungle canopy, if I set the maximum ISO at 6,400, there's a lot of times where it hits that ISO 6,400 and it doesn't have enough light. 
So then I'm shooting, 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 and the pictures are just underexposed because I'm not letting the camera let enough light in. Okay. Um, and I don't review the shots as I'm shooting because I don't want to be distracted by that playback. So I don't know until afterwards. I just took a string of shots that are three stops underexposed because the camera doesn't have enough ISO. Um, you can adjust the, the look of the image, brighter or darker, with the exposure compensation, but you have to press the exposure comp button and then dial that down because both dials are taken up. One's the aperture, one's the shutter speed. Um, now, with image stabilization like we have, you don't always need a thousandth of a second when you're using a long lens. So I don't mind if the shutter speed is a little bit slower. I don't need to set the shutter speed at a thousandth of a second or five hundredth of a second. I don't have to do that. So this this way of shooting for me has been more of a drag than anything because of if you're shooting in low light, um, you will get to a point where the camera can't get enough light in and you'll underexpose shots. So that brings me to the way that I shoot um, most of the time is an aperture priority. This is for, for wildlife. So I'll set the ISO based on the light. And I know if I'm going to be shooting in, in the forest, in the dark, I'm going to set the ISO at 3,200 or maybe 6,400. And then I'm going to set the aperture, which normally on a, if I'm trying to get as much shutter speed as I can, then I'm going to have the, the aperture wide open. So I know I'm letting as much light as I can get in. And then I've got the ISO as high as I want it to go because I don't want it to get so high that I'm not going to get all the detail that I want in my images. Then I can use exposure compensation to adjust the brightness. And the beauty of these cameras is that with the electronic viewfinder, I can see exactly what the exposure is going to be, right? And so if I, if I need to adjust the exposure compensation, I just turn a dial. I don't have to press the exposure comp button. I can just do it in real time, turn a dial, and that makes it faster for me to adjust the brightness or darkness of the image if I have to. Um, now, you do have to watch the shutter speed because it, without some limit on it, the shutter speed can, it might go to a half a second or, you know, if you're in a really dark area. Um, but again, I know with these cameras, I can hold the camera still at a 30th of a second. So it's not a big deal if it goes that slow. Unless I'm photographing something, obviously, that's moving. Um, then I want to keep that a little bit faster. So I might have to raise my ISO. But for me and my experience, that's the, the easiest way for me to get the exposure that I want as fast as possible. And so that I'm, I'm getting most of the shots that I want to get. And this is, uh, just include, this is in my front yard. This is part of my bird studio, um, at ISO 800 at a 400th of a second at F9 with the, uh, the 100 to 400 millimeter and the MC14 teleconverter. Perfectly sharp. This I, I love to show people this picture when they say, well, you can't get uh, shallow depth of field with micro four thirds. That that cracks me up. That's just that just shows that you've only done research on the internet and never with a camera in your hand with a lens on it. Because obviously you can get a shallow depth of field with whatever you want. You just have to know how to use the camera. So that is my slideshow. And now we can take uh, some questions, if we have some, I'm going to stop sharing and um, I'm not sure if the comments will be in here. Yep. Um, let's see. Hi. Hello, I'm back. I see. I was sending links to people. <laughs> nice. So we did there... get a, a few comments and I want to go back up to a couple. Um, right now I'm going through a lot of comments, everybody asking about um, lenses and things like that right now. As soon as you started talking about your gear, the lenses mm -hmm. took over. So I'm going to scroll back up here. Okay, you scroll. I'm going to answer this one. Why don't I shoot yep. in shutter priority? Um, because in shutter priority mode, the, the camera is, for most of the situations that I'm in, the camera is going to be the aperture is going to be wide open. Okay. So it's not really important to me if the camera is shooting at a 30th of a second or a 60th of a second, if it's, if it's dark, it, the difference between a 500th of a second and 320th of a second for me is not important because the image stabilization allows me to shoot at a slower shutter speed than I could maybe then I even realize I can shoot at. So I know the aperture is going to be wide open. And then the, if the shutter speed floats a little bit, it's not the end of the world. I know I'm going to get a sharp shot, um, even if, you know, unless my subject is moving, of course, and then I have to think about motion blur. Um, but 
I don't need to set the shutter speed at 500th of a second or, or whatever, because I can shoot slower than that. So it's not a big deal. And if I'm shooting birds in flight, a lot of times that's one of the instances where I will shoot in manual exposure mode so that no matter what the background is for the bird, I'm still going to get the correct exposure, whether he's in front of the bright sky or dark trees or something like that. So, so that's why I don't use shutter priority mode. Um, back, I use back button focus sometimes. Um, in fact, my, um, for some reason for me, it's uh, kind of natural to use back button focus on the EM one X and I don't use that on the EM one Mark three. Um, I don't really have a, uh, a, a big heavy reason for doing that. But, um, if you're not familiar with that back button focus is using this button on the back, the, uh, uh, AEL AFL button as the uh, to activate your autofocus and then your shutter release only fires the trigger, right? So you're not refocusing every time you touch the trigger. So you effectively get continuous autofocus and single autofocus kind of at the same time because when you hold the button down on the back, then you're continuously autofocusing because uh, you've got it in CAF mode. And then when you release that, the focus is going to stop where you left it. So it's kind of like single autofocus. So I, I do use that for birds a lot of times, yeah. Um, no, I, I don't, I, I get, I like to be a little more, um, a little more active, a little more engaged when I'm shooting. So to, to set up a remote camera and, and do that, I, I don't have the patience for it. Honestly, I'm not a fisherman either kind of for the same reasons. I like to go look for things to photograph instead of, I don't do a lot of sitting and waiting. Uh, for focus modes, I usually uh, use uh, the way I have my camera set up is using the function lever under my thumb. I've got the number one slot is single autofocus with one spot. And I've got the number if I switch to number two, then I'm in continuous autofocus, not continuous autofocus with tracking, but regular CAF. And I use uh, I think it's a nine square uh, box in the middle for continuous autofocus. Um, that way I can uh, I can track. The camera will track focus using predictive autofocus within the box that I've set. Uh, and then say the bird flies into, uh, you know, behind a lot of branches and I can't get the focus to lock on the bird, then I can easily switch uh, the focus lever to number one. And I've got a single spot and single point focus and I can really pinpoint the bird's eye and get exactly the shot that I want there. The... Um, Let's see the, I do see a question about the EM five Mark three that I'm going to, I'm going to answer really quick with the 70 to 300. Um, I don't know why you couldn't get sharp shots with it on the, on the, on a different camera. If the lens is the same, there's no reason that the EM five Mark three wouldn't be compatible with the 70 to 300. And if you got good shots with your EM five, your original one, I, I can't imagine that it wouldn't be better on the Mark three. I don't know. Function button preferred settings. Um, I did set one of my function buttons on the top for the, uh, I set a, uh, one of the custom settings on the mode dial, right? The C123. Um, I set up a custom setting with the bird detect autofocus and continuous AF plus tracking. And then I set that, uh, that custom function to one of the buttons on top of the camera. So I can hit that button and immediately be in the bird tracking autofocus. And for me, that, is so much easier than going in and changing to tracking. I can just hit a button if the bird is moving and, uh, and use that separate focus. It works. I, I don't, I don't know how, is that like a scale of one to 10 as far as how that works? It works great sometimes. And sometimes it doesn't like if there's uh, a lot of branches between you and the bird, sometimes it will find the bird. It'll put a box around the bird, but it won't focus on the bird. Um, but in, in a lot of cases, birds in flight, it works great uh, in my experience. Um,
depth and it's kind of blending in, then the tracking has trouble. But um, otherwise, it seems to work fine. Um, I If I'm going to go to Costa Rica I, and, and you've never been, I would go to, uh, I love the Central Pacific Coast. That's where I've been hosting my workshops for the last few years. And that's is after doing workshops in the northern central part of the country for about 10 years. And the Central Pacific is, you, you get basically the same wildlife you get in the north part of the country, plus a lot of animals from the southern part of the country that you don't see in the north. Um, it's, it's where the dry forest and the wet forest meet. It's a transitional area, so you get lots of different wildlife. Um, plus, it's only an hour from the airport. And it's just an easy trip. If you're going to Costa Rica for the first time and you want to see birds, that's a great spot. Um, the uh, Osa Peninsula is also phenomenal. It's a little more of a chore to get down there, but um, it's also a fantastic place to photograph wildlife. Awesome. I thought that would be a good one to end on because cool. it's, it's a personal thing. Your favorite place. I love that. I love hearing for sure. what people really like to shoot. It was really great having you tonight. And I feel like you answered so many awesome questions and shared a lot of really great images. And we just really appreciate you being an Olympus educator and being a part of our program tonight. My pleasure. Thank, thank you. And thanks to everyone that asked all the questions down there in the comment section. Our fingers have been going like crazy. We're trying to keep up with all your questions. And like I said, if we don't get them all finished right now, we will be circling back to try to answer all your questions. Um, and we just really appreciate your time tonight. Yeah. And I hope everyone had a good good uh, event here. I guess it's an event now that we live virtually. All events are in the computer. Thank you for joining our computer event. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for watching, right. guys. Everyone have a great night. Yeah, cheers.